Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Merciful God, on this day again, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you've brought us together today. We are here for a reason, for a purpose that only you know. But your spirit has prompted us to come together in worship, whether we're here in person or whether we are online or whether we're watching this later. May you speak to all of us. May we open to receive your message. And may we be blessed today by your word. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in 2008... Major Phil Packer was struck by a rocket blast. He was serving with the British Armed Forces in Basra, Iraq. And in the blast, he suffered major heart and spinal injuries to such a degree that the paramedics told him <clears throat> that he would never walk again. But they were wrong. A year later, he completed the London Marathon on crutches. And he started the marathon with the main group of racers and he finished it 13 days later. He covered about two miles a day and in the process he took 52,400 steps. Now how do we know how many steps he took? Because when you're told that you will never walk again, Every step is worth counting. And so Major Packer's efforts <clears throat> were more than just an amazing story of, of human will in overcoming the arts. He did it as a fundraiser and donated more than a million pounds to help for heroes a charity that rebuilds the torn-up lives of people injured in military service. And each day along the road, he was joined by scores of supporters in tears, families of lost soldiers, entire schools of inspired children, cops, firefighters, politicians. And so after 13 days, he finally limped in at the finish line. But in every other sense of the word, he was all in. So in verse 13 of our scripture reading, 
Paul says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. Major Packer's journey was mostly a physical striving. For the Apostle Paul, it was mostly spiritual. And his words in Philippians are putting uh, a challenge in front of all of us. Are we all in with God? Or are we going to limp in? Now Paul is using this well-known image of a marathon, of a race. He's running a spiritual race. And he's pressing on toward the goal. And he expects to finish and achieve the prize. And he says, if you want to run this race well, if you want to be efficient, then there are some things you need to shed. You need to get rid of some things that you don't need, things that slow you down and impede your running. He says, shed the useless stuff so that your running can be light and effective. And what you need to get rid of, he says, is the past. Get rid of the past and forget the past. Let go of it. So when Paul looks at his past, what he sees is an impressive religious resume. A Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, the right pedigree and all the necessary credentials. But looking back, he also sees some equally impressive failures. How he prosecuted the church of Jesus Christ and had his followers killed, for instance. And so he says in verse 7, those things were important to me, but now I think they are worth nothing because of Christ. Not only those things, but I think all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've lost all those things. And now I know they are worthless trash. He says, I let go of the past because all those things are worthless now the good and the bad. And he uses the word skubala, which is gently translated in English as rubbish or trash. But the real meaning is a little closer to another English word that starts with an S. So he's making a point here. He says, let go of the past, okay? Because anything we try to bring to the table is a fat pile of theological rubbish. It's of no use as we endeavor to know Christ fully. You see, we all have a past, don't we? And maybe when you look at your past over the years, you see some sense of of spiritual merit. You have a long-term record of attending church. You have seen some growth in your faith. You have learned more self-control and and, and discipline. You have grown in your spiritual knowledge. You've been giving faithfully to the church. You've been involved in ministry. Or maybe when you look at your past, what you see are some things that They make you feel unworthy of Christ. You've lived through a failed marriage or you've struggled with some some secret habits or there's some form of addiction in your past. And you're dealing with shame. And it's been a struggle for you, your past. And you feel unlovely and you feel unlovable. Paul's message is that Both the checkered past and the sterling past have the same thing in common. They are scubala. 
They are worthless when it comes to your merit before God. You see, the shocking thing <clears throat> about God's grace is that we are meritless. We can't bring anything good enough to get God to love us. And we can't do anything vile enough to sever God's love for us. And it's hard for most of us to believe this <clears throat> and to feel this because grace is the opposite of how most of our human relationships operate. We can talk about unconditional love, but we really don't fully know the true meaning. Employees offer performance bonuses, right? Not unconditional bonuses. We're all closer to certain members of our family than others, and we can't really explain why. Our friends are, are usually people who share affinities with us humor or intelligence or hobbies or income, education, kids and more. So what I'm saying is that, that very few, if any of our relationships, teach us what our relationship with God is supposed to look like. The fact that we are loved because of him and not because of us. Richard Rohr says, God does not love us because we are good. He loves us because he is good. Why can't we surrender to that? Because it initially feels like a loss of power and importance. So what we need to do is to let go let go of any sense of self-importance in our relationship with God. doesn't matter if you're pretty good or not good enough. Who you have been simply doesn't change God. Now let me try and make it uh, a little more practical. Um, let's say hypothetically in our church there is a, <clears throat> a single mom you know, who kind of never learns. She's been stringing together one bad relationship after the other. She has two kids by two different fathers, and, and the story just goes on. And let's say, hypothetically, there's a successful businessman in our church, and he's very generous to the church, and he serves passionately as an elder, and he's a model of Christ following in our church. And so let me ask you, of those two people, who does God love more? Who is more responsible for their righteousness? Who is more worthy of their forgiveness? Who brings more to the table for God? The point I'm making is that God simply has no favorites, okay? He doesn't see people as we tend to see them. Listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't pursue holiness. Because that's not the point here. We should live lives of obedience and goodness in response to God's love and forgiveness towards us. We should. We should grow in our faith and become more like Christ out of gratitude for his gift to us. But the point Paul is making is clear. We have really no merit before God. He says, I could not make myself acceptable to God by obeying the law of Moses. God accepted me simply because of my faith in Christ. And so I'm trusting Christ to save me. Not who I am. Not what I have done. Or what I have accomplished. 
For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith and not merit. And so I'm not counting on my past and who I've been. I'm counting on Christ alone. And so like Paul, we must let go of the idea that our good or bad past performances precondition God to love us more or less. So in that sense, forget your past, whether good or bad. And so what do we need to do instead? Paul says live into the future instead. Having shed the unnecessary baggage, Paul, the runner, now says we should press on. We should strain forward with our eyes on the prize. And so if we can only follow his example, <clears throat> then we can be set free as well, can't we? Regardless of who we have been. Like Paul, we can also <clears throat> be set free to the future that God has in store for us. He says in verse 14, I run toward the goal so that I can win the prize of being called to heaven. This is the prize that God offers because of what Christ has done. So Paul's motivation is clear. <clears throat> he wants to share Christ's resurrection one day. And that's his ultimate goal. That'll be the finish line for him. In the meantime, he's part of expanding God's kingdom. He's living his life for Christ. He's living into the future as one who has been redeemed. Because you see, that is our calling as people of faith. People of faith in Christ. We have to live as people who've been set free by the grace of Christ. People who've been made Christ's own. People who follow him and want to grow in their faith and their walk with him in this world. People who express his love toward those who cross their path. People who have a purpose to make a difference in the world in Christ's name. People who pursue hope at all costs. People who want to be part of God's future. People who work for unity and reconciliation and justice like the Bellar Confession says. People who believe that, that God can do more than we can ever even imagine. People who ask God what the future can look like. People who ditch their fears that might hold them back. People who are alive, but they're alive in Christ. And so Paul says, I will be one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. I don't mean to say I'm perfect, okay? I haven't learned all I should even yet, but I keep working toward that day when I will finally be all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. He says, I'm living in the freshness of new life. I'm definitely not perfect. But I let go of the past and I live into God's future. Major Peter Packer had two ways in which he could have approached life after that fateful blast in Iraq. The first was to collect the disability check and a whole lot of sympathy because of his past. And I don't think any of us would have blamed him if that was his choice. That would be a fair approach for what he went through in life, right? Don't you think? It's something any one of us could have and would have done if we were in his situation. But for him, that was limping in. And the other option was to, to call the past irrelevant in light of the future. To believe he would walk again. 
to take on the risk of big financial goals and a new purpose in life, to endure insufferable pain so he could change the experience of others like him, to help other heroes like him. And that's not limping in. That is all in. The Apostle Paul had a similar choice. Could have let his past define him, but he chose to let his faith in Christ steer him into a future with and for God. And we have the same choice today. We can choose to limp in, or by God's grace, we can choose to be all in. Now, here's what's amazing about God and his grace. He even allows us to to limp in. There are many people who, people in church, who can check off, you know, the, the I'm saved box. They, like Paul, will share in the resurrection of Christ when they die, Because they have, if nothing else, put their faith in Christ Jesus. But they're not fully living out this new life in Christ. God's unconditional love covers even Sunday-only Christians, or every other Sunday-only Christians, or whatever you want to say. The question, however, is, will you be living before you die? Are you confined to your past, whether good or bad, whether filled with successes or failures, or have you been freed from your past? Have you let it go? Are you alive in Christ and working for his kingdom? Are you living into the future? Are you aiming for the prize at the finish line? Are you dreaming with God about what next month could look like? And are you doing something about it today? So if you are limping, you know, today, by God's grace, please keep limping. Because soon, with God's grace, you can be all in with Christ. And as you reach for the finish line, you will receive the prize of life above. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, I am grateful that there is a future, that our past, whether it be good or bad, what we have done or maybe left undone. It's not what's most important. It's what lies ahead of us. May your spirit enable us to let go of the past and to look forward, to strain forward to a different future, a future that ultimately will be with your Son, Jesus Christ, through faith in him. And as most or many of us limp along in our spiritual lives, we are grateful for your grace. But may you move us, passionately move us, to be all in. All in in this life. As we look forward to the next. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.